Hello, good afternoon. I have a big task ahead of me. But anyways, I'll try to keep you guys awake so you learn from whatever I can share from my experiences in logistics. Um, well, as introduced, I am the CEO of Generica Drugstore, but to give you just a background, um, I never thought I would be in logistics uh, when I graduated from college with a degree of marketing management. Um, this was, I think, the last thing I would have wanted to get myself into. Um, and now um, I can say that I am lucky that I got into logistics because it's, I guess, by sheer luck now it's helping our business in growing it and making it reach the tips of the Philippines as what we would really want to do. Okay, um, after graduating, I actually ended up first with a marketing firm and a fashion. I was in fashion for some time. And then out of sheer, I guess, God sent, I ended up with one of the biggest logistics companies at that time. And that's where I spent eight years, where I simply started from sales, selling the service, until managing a nationwide distribution where we launched one of the um, innovative services that we had before, um, which we called Roro or Roll On, Roll Off, which is also being used now. And actually, my boss then is somewhere in the audience. I have to make sure that I don't spill things too much. <laughs> but, um, and he was a very big help in, de in developing my knowledge about logistics and helping me to learn a lot about logistics. This is where I basically learned everything, um, including supply chain. I got to visit certain facilities in Shenzhen, Walmart facilities that exposed me to so many different things that can help um, grow uh, what we have right now. Um, this was also the venue where, I guess, um, my mindset on certain things were changed. Normally, uh, when problems arise, people would tend to look at it negatively and see the negative parts of that problem. Um, with my training, with um, the, my former um, employment, I now see problems as all opportunities and solutions to come out, which is why we were heading a group then that was called Solutions. And during my presentation, I'll give you an idea of how some of those things came, um, how some of the solutions we came up with started with simply listening to our customers. Okay, so basically, I'll tell you what Generica is first, and then I'll give you some of the logistics challenges that we go through every day, um, and then how strategic partnerships are important in growing your businesses, and obviously how we are overcoming some of those logistic challenges. Okay, so who we are, essentially, um, our vision is to be the most innovative national drugstore chain driven by a strong sense of social purpose. I think this is the main reason why my dad and his previous partner, uh, a French national, went into this whole business. It's because they wanted to be able to give all the Filipinos in the country access to quality, affordable, generic medicine at that point, which right now with the entry of Ayala, we've expanded it to quality, affordable healthcare. And of course, like all the other presenters this morning, customer service is at the top of that. We have to make sure that we serve our customers to the best that we can. Okay, in 2004, like I think um, it was mentioned, we opened our first store. It was in Montellano, Alabang, which is a small, small street um, under the Alabang Interchange. So that's where we decided to open our first store. Um, and after that, in 2008, after opening 16 stores, we then decided to open it up for franchising. And we had to develop first the right models, learn the right processes, um, put up our own POS system so that we could make sure that we would serve our customers to the best that we can. And one of the first things that we really felt was necessary at that point was to make sure that our stores were air conditioned. Um, for two main reasons. Basically, it's maintaining the quality of the medicines that you have. And second, it's, it's for customer convenience, okay? And then in 2011, um, I was asked to join, to move from my, the logistics company that I was working for 
to my father finally decided maybe it's time for you to come back because I was asked to join the company in 2010 and 2011 we went to Visayas and Mindanao. We expanded our services in our, in our drug stores to Visayas and Mindanao. This is where fortunately whatever logistics experience I would have picked up already by then would really help in our expansion. In 2014, we launched another product which would drive some of the innovative things that we've been doing in, in our business. Let's just say that Generica has always been known for its innovations because we've done so many innovative things that we know has been disrupting the, in the whole retail industry the past few years. Among that is Medpadala. Okay? Medpadala is actually an electronic gift check. That, um, the idea of it came about simply when one of our managers was in Hong Kong and he was talking to a couple of OFWs that were there and he was, ask, and he was asking, what challenges do you have? Um, what problems do you encounter when you're, deal when you're um, sending money or buying medicines for your relatives in the Philippines? And the main thing she said then was because they weren't sure whether the medicines, uh, the money that was being sent was, ba was basically used for medicines. There was no guarantee. So they would send so much money, but then every now and then, the brother, sister, or aunt would call again that they, we need more money for medicines. And he wasn't sure, or she wasn't sure what was happening to it. So this is where we felt that with this electronic gift check, now we can guarantee that whatever you send, um, amounting to whatever you send through Medpadala, the, uh, your beneficiaries in the Philippines can only use it for medicines that they buy in Generica drugstore. And we were promoting quality, affordable medicines. So then you would be assured that your family members would get the right medicines that they need and they would get well. And obviously in 2015, um, uh, Ayala uh, bought into the company. He, they actually bought the shares of my dad's previous partner. And now they've become our partner in growing this business ever, um, even bigger and more aggressively. And we're proudly part of the AC Health, which is a part of the Ayala Group. Like um, Richard mentioned, we now have 732 stores nationwide, a bulk of which is in Luzon simply because that's where we started our business. We started expanding in the southern part of Luzon before we went to the northern part, and now we have 114 stores in Visayas and 82 in Mindanao. Um, in the next years, we're looking at hitting more than 1,000 stores by 2020 with a lot of expansion of, uh, opportunities both in Visayas and Mindanao. These are really growing markets and we really want to extend all of our um, uh, access to affordable health care to more people that are in these regions because they are really deprived of the right health care. Health care doesn't really say it's only medicines that is part of health care. Health care involves even access to doctors. Most of these rural, most of the rural areas in these provinces besides in Mindanao don't even have doctors in their rural health offices. And if they even have doctors, they come there maybe once or twice a month. So what are what do these people have to do to get um, consultations or to get medicine? Sometimes they just ask, I guess, the next guy that's around. Or whatever they were prescribed with long years ago or maybe a couple of months ago is the same medicine that they simply try to take over and over again without knowing whether this would still work or not. Because what can they do if they don't have access to these doctors? Okay. And we have upcoming solutions to hopefully resolve that and give these, give these people the right access to quality health care. Um, we operate, sorry, we operate with one distribution center located in Cabuya, Laguna. Okay, they handle all of the order processing and deliveries nationwide. Um, it, it's in a 7,000 square meter facility which we used to have, before we transferred there, we were operating in a 1,200 square meter facility and serving 400 stores. We are now in a 7,000 square meter facility serving 732 and maybe even more in the coming years. Okay, so it's really a factor of being able to manage our inventories very well to make sure that we're stocked with the proper items at the right time. Um, maybe something is an offshoot of my learnings from my logistics experiences. Um, though we're in the distribution business, we're one of the more aggressive 
um, guys that are managing our own inventories in our distribution center. Most of the distribution businesses would maybe have 60 days or even more in terms of amounts of inventories in their warehouse facilities. We've been operating with only 45 days of inventories in our facilities. And that's quite aggressive to think that we're serving 732 stores and it's still going to grow even more. But how are we doing it? We're doing it with very, let's say, efficient suppliers. We try to work out and deal with efficient suppliers that have transparencies in terms of inventories so that we can manage our own inventories as well. There's also a big reliance on our logistics partners. We have to make sure that they can provide us with very good um, logistics services to make sure that we can have these products in our stores as well. Okay, like um, it's very important to make sure that it's clear with your logistics providers as to what is really needed to make sure that you get the products to the stores. We're only talking about the nature, the regular nature of our logistics business, which is delivering our products from our DC facilities to our stores. But as mentioned this morning, there's also a growing, um, growing e-commerce business. But unlike the other industries, pharma is a highly regulated business. Therefore, e-commerce is kind of difficult to do for pharma. But then, it, it's not impossible. And we know that there are some companies that are start, slowly starting into offering e-commerce for pharma as well. So sooner or later in the coming years, you won't be surprised if e-commerce will be a platform for pharma, even though we may be a highly regulated business. <coughs> we offer a wide range of products. This is something that most people wouldn't know. Our name is Generica, but we don't only have generic products in our portfolio. Okay, we also have branded medicines, of course. Consumer goods, we have selected consumer goods, basically the basic water and paper products. So um, we have water, we have ready to drink um, juices. We also have the tissues, adult diapers, children's diapers, and the likes. We have galenicals, medical supplies, and just recently we're also offering wellness products or supplements. This is also something different that our drugstore would want to promote. Because people normally go to drugstores because they're already sick. That's the curative side of, uh, of looking at you know, the drugstore business. But why can't drugstores promote wellness as well? Why can't drugstores promote preventive as well? Why should these things only be available in GNC, healthy options, and the like? Which are limited in terms of locations. You can only see them in malls. So, as well as when we want to promote healthcare, what we're actually trying to promote is also preventive healthcare, not only curative healthcare. Because we, we don't see our customers as, um, let's say, a, a way of simply getting money, a way of getting revenues. We always look at our customers as future long term partners, and we want to make sure that we take care of them so that at the end of the day, they will continue to come back to us. And we, the longer we extend their lives, the longer their business may be for us. Um, aside from all of these basic products that we offer, we also offer a number of what we call different plus services. And these are services, some of these services you get for free, and some of these services you get at the very um, let's say affordable price or a very low cost. So obviously in all of our stores we offer free BP monitoring which is important. Um, the cases of hypertension is growing and it's growing every year. And fortunately um, this is something that the government is trying to control and trying to manage but I don't know how efficiently they've been able to do it but it's a growing concern. We also offer blood sugar testing. Okay, so we offer fast, fa um, fasting blood sugar testing and random blood sugar testing. The difference is only the other one you need to fast before you take it, and the other one is you can take it at any time of the day. We also offer cholesterol testing, uric acid testing. One of the unique services that we've started and we've continuously done through our stores is the mobile laboratory services. We offer um, laboratory services at a rate of 250 to 300 pesos where you can get actually seven tests done. And that's pretty cheap. 
but they're not cheap in the sense that you get um, the results are, unre are unreliable. We have to make sure that all of the partners we deal with also offer the same quality service that we want to offer. So we're also making sure by accrediting all of these providers and making sure that they do their services properly so that the same quality service is extended to all of our customers. Another thing we've done is the Libre Consulta or the medical consultation. This is something that we offer every month, once or twice a month. And this is our way of answering the need of the fact that most people do not have access to doctors or most people would rather spend their money for medicines than paying it for a consultation with a doctor. How much do doctors charge now for consultation? So if you get free consultation, that gives them the, the less privilege now, the chance to use their money for the medicines that they need to get well. And this is something that we've been doing for so long and now every other retail drugstore is starting to do on a regular basis as well. Another thing that we've done to enhance the service which is free is what we call the Gamot Guide. What's a Gamot Guide? A Gamot Guide is actually transport, transferring the contents of a prescription which more often than not you can't read. Um, I guess our doctors were not necessarily given penmanship um, lessons when they were in college, but more often than not you can't read. We transfer it into a, a printout from our POS that puts the details of that prescription in layman's terms and easier for our customers to understand. It gives you an idea of how often you need to take the medicine, um, if you can take the medicine before or after meals, or if you can, what other major minor side effects that you may want to know when you take the medicines. And this is something that you can bring home. It doesn't get, um, uh, what's this, erased because it's printed on paper. And it's pretty handy, so you can just put it in your wallet in case you need to bring it. Obviously, the more medicines you buy, the longer the tape receipt can get. No? So hopefully, we won't get to the point where we'll, we give you rolls of tape receipt, because that means you're really taking too much medicine by that point. Okay, so these are some things that we give for free. These are not charge, additional charges, but it's part of our services in order to make sure that we're giving you quality health care. And obviously, I talked about Medpadala earlier. Okay, our stores, as mentioned earlier, are fully air-conditioned, mainly to maintain the quality. We are in a tropical country. It tends to be very hot, especially during summer, and that really affects the quality of the medicines. Expo extended exposure to medicines causes the medicine to degrade, and the quality is also degraded. You lose more of the efficacy of the medicines at that point. Okay, this is where we also want to try to look for um, providers, logistic providers that can help us because our warehouse facilities are fully air conditioned to make sure that we maintain it in our, the quality in our warehouse facilities. Our stores are fully air conditioned to make sure that we maintain the quality. However, the distance from our warehouse to our stores is where we have a gap in trying to maintain that quality. But as long as we can find ways to send these things to the stores at a faster time and with less exposure to heat elements, we can still try to make sure that we maintain those qualities. Logistic challenges. So what do we go through every day? Um, first, of course, is the wide assortment of products. We carry 2,400 active products every day and they come in multiple sizes from the smallest tablet that can be a in a flap that's maybe one inch by two inch to a very big product and a heavy product as far which is water or the diapers the adult diapers which are very big so the wide assortment makes it difficult for us to put these things together pack them properly also there are some products that come from our suppliers that don't have the proper packaging we end up putting bottles beside bottles. And my logistics experience tells me that's the fastest way you're going to have breakages and that's the easiest way you're going to have damages with all of the other products that are put together in those. So we have to have so many other ways of repacking these things because when stores order, they order in different quantities, they, or they order in, in um, different molecules all at the same time and we have to find a way to pack them together in such a way that they don't get damaged. 
Okay, so these are the main problems that we encounter to on a daily basis. Also, these products, the bottled medicines and the water products, we know are very heavy and volumetric. They can be, they can take up so much space. So the challenge is, how do we send them now to the stores? What are the better ways to send them to the stores so that they are not too expensive? And unfortunately, my experience with franchisees is the moment I mention the word air freight, they automatically see lots of uh, zeros and numbers coming out and it's, a, it's too expensive. Air freight is always connoted to be too expensive. But if you have a proper knowledge of what makes up the cost structures when they charge you for air freight, you know that it can actually be cost efficient. Air freight is normally based on volume, volumetric weight or actual weight, whichever is higher. So you're talking of tablets and capsules, which are not volumetric and they're not heavy. So the most efficient way for me to send them to the provinces is by air. Everything else you may have to send by sea. Also, experience tells me you send bottled products by, by air, chances are you'll have leakages when they get to the outports. Why? Because air pressure tends to push the liquid up, expand, and maybe even seep through whatever caps or bottles that are closures that are there, so they tend to leak. Okay, so it really causes problems when sending them by air. So it's managing how, which volumes you send by air and which volumes you send by sea. So what we do for if there's a franchisee that wants to ship cargoes, we send them the cost estimates. Sir, this is the cost if you send it by air, this is the cost if you send it by sea. At the end of the day, you decide on which one you feel is the most cost efficient way for you. Okay, and this is where I, I normally tell them if the difference between air and sea freight, uh, the air and sea freight charges is less than a thousand pesos, I think it's better to send it by air. Okay. Challenge number two is the road infrastructure in the Philippines. This is something that is really a problem in terms of when you have to make deliveries in the rural areas. We have provinces in the Philippines where I, I think they really did not have any planning as far as infrastructure was concerned. Some of the roads can be really small that if you bring a truck, you'd probably smash the right side and left side of the truck or the truck wouldn't even fit at all. And in some areas, there's really no parking space available for trucks. And the harder problem is the truck bans. When we have truck bans where you cannot bring the trucks into these areas, especially on, on certain times of the day. So this is where road infrastructure becomes a problem. Also, our roads are not that nice. Every now and then, we had to re-asphalt the roads or worse, if they need to spend their money, they have to destroy the roads altogether and put concrete again and re-asphalt again. So this happens more often when an election year or the election period comes. So these are the things that really damage the products. As the trucks move on with the different boxes and then the different items put together, they tend to move up and down, shake left and right, and chances are by the time they get somewhere, the, the original configuration of the products inside would have changed because of the road infrastructure. And, and, and even, um, I've, I've seen this in, in some provinces very close to Manila, but I've experienced it before when I was handling the nationwide operations for Roro. For you to travel from one province to another, sometimes they charge you taxes just to drive through that province. Okay. It's not free to just drive through the highway and go through their cities or provinces. If you're driving a delivery truck, they can actually stop you and charge you for simply going through. Okay. And the, this is the biggest challenge for our industry, it's temperature. Because like I mentioned a while ago, products can really be, sent, our products are very sensitive to temperature. And they really affect the quality of the product. So we have to make sure that the faster we can get our products to the stores, the better in terms of maintaining the quality of the products. Um, there are even instances where our soft gels, which are very sensitive to temperature, during summer, we have to send them by air. And even if we send them by air, we, may have, to, we have to put them in styro boxes and consider putting something to keep the, those, those boxes even still cold, even if you put them in styro boxes. Because 
we've had experiences where they actually melt even before they get to the stores. Because our temperatures, there were times where I was um, putting thermometers inside their trucks just to try to find out what temperatures would these trucks go through, what the products would go through on a regular summer day. Some of them would go beyond 40, 45 degrees. And that would really melt the soft gels already. And at, again, you'll have returns because by the time it gets to the stores, they'd see it melted, they won't accept the products, and then they'd return them to you. Unfortunately, I cannot turn around and give them back to my supplier because when I got it from them, it was in good condition. So temperature is really a problem, and I hope that sooner or later, we can find a cheaper way of keeping this uh, within respectable temperatures. It doesn't have to be um, at least 25 to 28 degrees is, is pretty safe. And it doesn't have to be that cold. All it has to do is keep it within that temperature range to make sure that nothing happens to the products. Um, I'm currently reviewing uh, uh, a mode of, of doing that that was recently offered to us by one of one of the logistics providers that is in the Philippines. And hopefully we can see if we can get to use that for some of these products. We also have products that are cold chain related or temperature controlled between two to eight. These are normally the biological products. So it cannot go lower than two degrees and it cannot go higher than eight degrees. The, any, any temperature drop or increase beyond that range makes that product useless. And you dispose of the product and it's a big loss already. So we really have to be able to monitor and maintain. So if we have to put, put trackers inside these temperature controlled boxes to make sure that we monitor that they don't go beyond those temperatures, that's what we need to go. Just to make sure that when we say we deliver products, you still get the same quality products. Um, no fixed delivery arrival time. This is the common complaint I get from my franchisees. Of course, they sell to different customers. Sometimes they sell to corporate customers and they make a commitment. They, they know that their delivery normally arrives at, let's say, 11 in the morning. So they'll tell the customer, come back, ma'am, at 12 noon and I'll have your product for you. Unfortunately, our trucks carry multiple stores. Each truck can have maybe 10 to 15 store uh, drops within one trip. So there's no assurance of what time they're going to get to your store. So if they get, normally get it at 11, unfortunately along the way the truck gets a problem or there's a big accident somewhere and the truck gets caught, it won't arrive there on time. Therefore, the customer now that came back to that store at 12 noon won't get anything. And that's already a problem because then you'd have an angry customer and I hope that they're not angry enough not to come back if ever there are other instances. And this is also a big problem that we're trying to overcome. <coughs> High logistics costs, as already mentioned, um, unfortunately, um, during my time we were joking that it's actually cheaper to send something from Manila to Hong Kong than from Manila to Davao or Manila to some other parts in, the, in Mindanao. Logistics costs in the Philippines can really get very expensive. And this is one thing that affects lead time, our Coast Guard and Marina policies during stormy weather. And this is why um, we've had to look through different means to, in order to address, because the moment you send anything by sea, and, fortunate, and unfortunately, Pag-asa declares signal number one in Metro Manila, no matter how big the vessel is parked in the marina, it's not going to get any clearance from Coast Guard or from Marina. So it's going to stay there and until it's not lifted, it's going to sit there. So that's why we have all of these delays. And another challenge we were having in logistics was when our network development team was going around, sometimes they would go around and look for the first available site and open it, even though these, the, the sites are not necessarily in one straight line or they're not clustered together. So that becomes a logistics problem. It's more expensive because then the, the last store that will be delivered that's out of the way would have to cover for the big cost difference from all of the other stores that were clubbed together. 
So this is something that we had to work together with our network development team to make sure that when we go on expansion, we start expanding, we do it in clusters. This makes, it, this makes logistics more efficient, cost efficient for everyone else within that, the, the cluster of source. Geography, as mentioned a while ago, because of so many islands, is definitely, we are one of the most challenging logistics um, countries. Okay, so the importance of strategic partnerships. There are a lot of logistics providers that we have used, a number of which are already here, and some of which we're talking to. And there's so many more. Okay, so there's so much, so many to choose from. Okay, but, what I would suggest is to look for a logistics provider that does not only hear you, but one that listens and understands your company's needs. This is my, from my own experience of being on the other side of that spectrum in logistics and now being on the side of the customer. I've talked to so many in logistics providers, I've talked to so many agents, and I keep selling them the same stories. But when they come back, all they give me is the rate proposals. This is our rate, sir. Uh, okay, so what do I do with your rate now? Okay, so this is very important. This is something, as I, pro I progress on, I will show you because this is something I guess that we started off and got my mind into this mindset when we started off in my previous work, okay? So you really have to make sure that your logistic partner listens to you. Why? Because, let's say, they will be able to provide you with the solutions that will meet your logistics needs. They should be able to adopt their services in order to meet your needs, not you adapting to their services. And, or they can tot create a totally new service specifically for you. I'll go through some examples which I'll share from my own experiences when I was here with the logistics business. Uh, like I said, we were part of a division called Solutions. So what, did, what were we doing? Whatever problems other departments would have, they'll throw it on our table and we had to come up with solutions. So one of the problems that were normally given to me was, then was, High temperatures inside the vans, like I was explaining, the temperature, the vans, the temperatures would really rise up. So what solutions did we come up with? Essentially, we put louvers in the vans. Louvers in the front part, on the sides, and even the back portion of the vans were put with uh, extra doors that were, as, as you can see there, but you can see in another picture. Here are the louvers in front, the uh, front portion. There you have covers there that can, can open. This is where it is. And then the rear door, when you close it, it's open. So when the truck is moving, air flows through the truck, therefore pushing the hot air out, and you can reduce the temperatures inside the trucks. So this was one way we solved the problem, going to the uh, Visayas Mindanao area. And coming back, we could actually load fruits and vegetables inside these trucks, and the issue of temperature won't be there because the trucks are actually exposed and open, but not exposed enough that you can steal the bananas or the fruits that are inside, okay? So another problem that was given to us, there the doors are, was long lines during deliveries to key accounts. Sometimes when you deliver to the key accounts, those that are in the logistics, you have to wait for your number to be called. Therefore, your truck is, seat, is standing there waiting for nothing. Your driver, Painante, is doing nothing. Helper is doing nothing. So how did we address that? We borrowed something that is being done in the States. So we ended up with the U-Hauls. Something that you can attach to the rear of the trucks, and it's something that I believe LBC is offering. LBC is already offering this right now. So it's U-Hauls. You save on the truck manpower. You save on the helper manpower by just leaving the U-Haul while it's waiting for the line, and then the main truck delivers to another account. Okay, so this is something that we were able to come up with. But again, this is by listening to what our customers were saying. Another one was stacking limitations of products. 
So truck capacity is not fully maximized. There are products that are, can only be stacked seven high, five high, but when you put them inside the truck, you see there's an empty space on top, but you still pay for that empty space. So, but then you have stacking limitations. So what do you do? Well, we ended up by, this is the normal, how a truck would normally look like, but then we found a way to create a mezzanine level by adding another layer, a metal frame, so you can now stack your products higher. You can maximize the space much more. And what's good is, after you deliver to the account, you can take out the metal racks, put them inside the truck, and use them like a regular truck. It works for whatever kind of trucks you're using. Okay. So, another part of strategic partnership is that as you progress, there are lots of ups and downs. Thus, I guess what's more important with the groups that are concerned is you have to look beyond revenues and costs. If you want to maintain long-term strategic partnerships, I guess it's more of what we'll see in the future than what we're seeing at the present. If you stick too much on the costs and revenues concerned, you won't get anywhere. Because obviously, you want to reduce your costs and they want to increase their revenues. So someone has to give in or you both give in. <clears throat> and then industries normally have unique requirements that your logistics provider should be able to understand and they, have, they need to be able to open to address these needs, specific needs. It's not all the same when you're talking to our industry, our requirements are very different from the e-commerce industry and all of the other industries that may be there. Okay, we have uh, more things to, to to um, what's this? More or less, be careful of of their care of take care of because of the kind of products that we're actually moving. Okay, so how is Generica handling its logistics challenges? Basically, we use right now. Unfortunately, since I cannot look for one yet that can provide me with all of these needs, we're still using multiple providers. We have truckers for Luzon, and we use. Um, uh, logistics providers for Visayas Mindanao. Our biggest logistics provider now is LBC. And they've been giving us very good service for the past, I believe, two or three years or even longer. Um, but then we have to source other providers because we've not been able to come up with a solution for some of the other needs that we still have. Evaluating solutions to address the cold chain requirements. We are now looking at other ways. As mentioned, I'm currently evaluating a uh, uh, system that's been recently prevented, presented to us that would help us address the cold chain requirements. Because it, since it takes a while to get the products, like for by air now, we normally take two to three days to get it to where we want to send it. But when you put ice gels in these, um, temp for the temperature control requirements, they cannot last for two to three days. So we have to look for other ways to be able to sustain the temperature for two to three days. And that's even sending it by air. Imagine our sea lead time right now can be from 10 to 20 days. So by that time, wala na. That, that product would have been gone. Okay. And then we have moved from centralized, from our Kabuyao, we're now going semi-decentralized. When I say semi-decentralized, we start having service hubs, service stores in clusters so that any immediate needs of the stores in the clusters can be serviced by that service store. Okay, so we're now going outside, but we're not putting up depots, we're not putting up um, big facilities in certain areas. We're going it in smaller sizes and going to, to the smaller clusters that we have. And obviously the use of multimodal delivery network. So um, as I think uh, there was a mention this morning that he was surprised that some items were being loaded onto an animal to, for delivery. Um, in my previous work, we were considering unloading the Picos machines on goats just to deliver to a mountain because then there were no other ways to get it there. Or you hire a guy to ride a horse and maybe run for two to three days to get it to where it's supposed to be delivered. So this is the extent that you have to go through in the Philippines. So now we're also looking at different modes because of the volume of products that we have, which are pretty small normally, 
we may be able to use other modes just to make sure that we can shorten the lead time. So the faster we can get it to the stores, our target is to get it to our stores before 12 noon. Okay, so we're going through different modes right now and we're talking to different means to enable to do this. But that's multimodal already. So to the point where we might use bicycles, we might use tricycles, we might use motorcycles. As long as they give us the, the standard to maintain the quality of that product and the faster they can get it to the stores, you know, much better. It also gives us faster delivery time to our stores as well. Okay, so essentially, even though the Philippines is a very big logistics challenge, nothing is impossible in the Philippines as long as you have the right partners, the right strategic partners. Nothing. We can do anything and everything to get these products where we want to be. Just make sure that you're talking to the right strategic partners. I'm making use of the word strategic because you have to go beyond money matters if, if you want to really grow this much better, much bigger. Okay, so essentially, um, Generica simply wants to be able to give quality, affordable healthcare down to every part of the Philippines, from the tip of Babuyan Islands maybe, but not all the way until to Holo, unless we have a logistics provider that's actually willing to deliver to Holo or Sulu. But then um, we want to be able to give these quality services, healthcare products, all of our medicines, all of our additional plus services down to the most remote areas of the Philippines if possible. Um, at the end of the day, we want to make sure that every Filipino has access to quality healthcare. Because in Generica, dito, lagging may plus ka. Thank you.